Hi, welcome everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started on the Simon Searchlight Virtual Family and Research Conference for CSNK 2A1. Um, we have a very packed agenda today, so I'll be brief um, before we get started. I just want to let everyone know that you're able to submit questions for your Q&A um, at any time during the presentations using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, so if you do have questions that come up during the presentation, feel free to send them in early. Um, and with that, we will introduce our first speaker. Um, so Wendy Chung is an MD, PhD and AM, ABMG board certified clinical and molecular geneticist with over 20 years of experience in human genetic research. She's a, a, the Kennedy Family Professor of Pediatrics and Medicine and the Chief of Clinical Genetics at Columbia University, the Director of Clinical Research at Safari and the Simons Foundation and the Principal Investigator of Simon Searchlight. And so here is Dr. Jung's presentation. Hi, I'm Wendy Chung. I'm a medical geneticist and pediatrician and the principal investigator for Simon Searchlight. Thank you for allowing me to be with you here today. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the information we've gathered on CSK, CSNK2A1, sorry about that, um, that we've gathered through Simon Searchlight. So let me give you some background to understand what Simon Searchlight is. And thank you for those of you who have contributed your data because it helps us all to be able to understand this condition better. So we created this, believe it or not, a little over 10 years ago uh, to bring together family groups that had rare neurogenetic conditions associated in some cases with autism. And we were doing this and we'll continue doing this to be able to provide what we call the natural history, understanding what this condition is, how it changes over the life course and understand the breadth of what we see with the hopes that by sharing information with each other, we can support each other, be able to figure out things that are what I'll call best practices or things that um, seem to be working better or conversely avoid things that might be not working as well. Um, today's presentation, as well as any of the materials that we get from Simon Searchlight are de-identified. That is that no one knows who you are when you participate, but we try and make these broadly available both to families as well as their providers, so their doctors, their teachers, their therapists. Then we also make this available to the research community so that researchers don't have to ask you the same questions over and over again, but rather um, multiple people can use the same information that you've been giving. Um, as we do this, uh, we hope that this is something that we continue to get information with people over time. So the same person, we go back on an annual basis to get updates because we know that things can change over the life course. And that might be especially important in times of puberty, uh, going into adulthood. Um, and for some of these, we want to be able to see, as I said, how these change and uh, give this information back to you and to the other families. So as I said, we started this over 10 years ago. Um, I say that because I, I want to understand, um, I personally was with this from the very beginning. I'm personally very dedicated to this and to our mission. Um, and we will continue this mission. Um, we are certainly going to continue forward. You've got our um, assurances that this is not something that's going to be ending anytime soon. And we have made this that it's international. Um, and we've worked really hard to be able to get a group of genetic counselors who speak with the families in many different languages. Um, we have ability to uh, offer the surveys and the tools where we're gathering information in many languages. And so we wanted to open this up to the entire world to be able to participate. If you do have suggestions about how we can do this better, please let us know. Um, we collect information, a combination of talking to the genetic counselors on the telephone. Um, those genetic counselors work with me, and many of you give me the feedback about how lovely they are, and I think they are too, um, and how much they know about these conditions. And so we hope that's helpful. And then we also have some of the information that we collect online because we know people are busy and we try and make something that's convenient for them. So as I said, um, this is something we're committed to doing for a, the long haul, for a long time to come. Um, and I realize it's somewhat confusing about where you are in the process and what this overarching goal is and um, how long it takes and what you're signing up for. So I thought I might explain this to you in terms of the process of Simon Searchlight. 
So the first part is determining eligibility, and that's where we look at a genetic test report to make sure that you're in the right club, um, to make sure that the particular thing that you think really is the cause of your child's challenges or your family member's challenges um, really is what we agree um, is what we think of as being associated with that condition. Um, I'd say in general, probably about 95% or so of the time, uh, folks are in the right club, and in fact, that information is the relevant information. But importantly, rarely, um, people are actually not in the right club. That is, that there's other testing that really should be done or something that um, may have been misunderstood either um, by the doctor that gave it or even by the uh, other people that were involved in that child's care. So we'd like to try and hopefully clarify that, answer some family's questions, and then in some cases be able to help them get to the, di the right diagnosis. Um, as I said, beyond that, once a family is eligible, and we determine that by reviewing a copy of the genetic test report. Um, like I said, many of you have that. I know sometimes you don't, in which case we'll have you sign a medical release and we'll go ahead and get that information on your behalf. Um, after we do that, we have the telephone interviews and this is mostly what I'm gonna be presenting today. Individuals who have been eligible and then largely the medical history as well as the previous diagnosis interview. Um, in general, this takes about an hour, about 60 minutes, talking with the genetic counselors on the phone. Many times they do this in the evening, on the weekends, try and make it easy for you. Um, and like I said, that's something that oftentimes it's helpful to have even some records, uh, baby books and other things by your side to look up some of the things like how much did your baby weigh when, or your child weigh when he or she was born. Um, and so that's all information we gather. We then use what we call standardized instruments. So these are things that have been done on, in some cases, uh, thousands, tens of thousands, many, many other people. So we have what we call normative data, or we know what in the general population score should look like. And it's a good way to be able to compare individuals across studies, across a population around the world. And we try and do these things, as I said, as rigorously as possible. So we wanna make sure your data are going to be used by many scientists. The first measure that we commonly use is called a Vineland Adaptive Behavioral Scale, and it's understanding for your particular uh, child or family member, uh, what are they able to do on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, so it's getting a sense of how they've been developing, and these things are uh, assess or take into account the person's chronological age. So obviously what you can do when you're three years old is different than what you can do when you're 13 years old. Um, we then have some other measures. Some of these are especially important uh, for certain conditions associated with, for instance, epilepsy. Um, we get more information on seizures. Um, I wanna highlight though that we also have measures that really came out of meetings like this, uh, came out of parents telling us things that they were observing. Uh, in many cases, because they had specialized knowledge, um, they may have been, I'll give you some examples, a dentist, a teacher, an educator. And so they were observing specific things in their family member, as well as sometimes at the family meetings, and suggested very specific things that we also ought to be looking at and analyzing. So the reason I make this point is that um, for you, you obviously live this 24-7, and there may be things that we haven't thought of, but we are very open to feedback and suggestions and iteratively improving to make this whole experience better for you and information that's going to be more valuable to the families. So please do give us feedback on this. Again, on the right side here uh, is my point that we collect this information over time. So it's not just one and done, but it's really a long-term commitment. And as I said, for some of the families, we've been doing this for almost a decade now. So. Um, continuing each year to be able to see how an individual is growing and developing and changing. So let me dive right into this and give you back some of the information about your condition, uh, CSNK2A1. Um, to be able to show how many people we're talking about, I think everyone realizes this is not a common condition, but we have gathered information on a, a few people. It's still, um, I think we've got work to do in terms of being able to increase our sample size or our numbers, um, but we're getting better for sure. So the first is that we started out with approximately, well, exactly 46 people who registered. Um, of that, approximately 70% or so uh, sent us their test reports to be able to review and see if they were in the right club. And in fact, as I said, the majority, about 24 of them, we did confirm that CSNK2A1 was the right diagnosis. And of those, almost everyone who was eligible uh, went on to do their medical history, talked to us on the telephone so that we could gather information. 
Now with this, um, there are some limitations. So I wanna be very clear about that. The first is that this is only 21 individuals on whom the information I'm gonna describe is based. And furthermore, the ages that we're talking about are individuals who are still relatively younger in age. So some even toddlers down to two years of age and our oldest within this series is only a young adult of 21 years of age. So within this, I think we still have things to learn, importantly, things to learn about what it's like to be an adult with this condition when you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. And so there is some information and some gaps I think we have to fill. Uh, we've got time to fill them, but we're very much looking forward to this um, to be able to find more adults or at least more young adults so that we can continue to watch them as they're getting older to see if there might be any special, especially either medical conditions um, that we need to screen for that might be in addition to usual care for an adult of the same age. And in particular, as we think about important transitions, importantly transitions to becoming an adult, um, if there are things that might be helpful to think about, things that are particularly uh, important or things that maybe everyone hasn't been thinking about. So we are quite anxious, uh, as I said, to especially focus on the older age of the spectrum. Okay, so um, you may have heard one of the sort of core lectures that we had, which was how to read your genetic test report. Um, you can uh, go back to your own genetic test report if it's helpful now and see if, it, if that makes sense. What I'm showing here is a summary of all sorts of different genetic variants that we've seen in the community with CSNK2A1. So these fall into different classes. Um, for the families, I'm not gonna focus too much on this today. This is a slide that I think is especially important for the researchers, so I'm gonna leave it up here for a minute. Um, but just to say that the majority of individuals in the group have a particular genetic change that we call a missense change. And all that means is that at the particular address, this is the number I'm showing here, at that particular address, there is one amino acid or one building block in the protein that is substituted for another one. So it's a very subtle change, a relatively modest change. I am showing you in parentheses here, particular genetic changes that were seen in this case in three independent individuals. So three unrelated people in different families, or in this case, eight unrelated individuals um, where this same change arose independently. What that tells us scientifically is there's something special probably about position 47 or position 198 in terms of the way this particular gene works. And in general, uh, we see the changes throughout the gene are not random, but they are particularly focused and concentrated in areas of the gene that we think are especially critical in terms of the way the gene functions. Again, I won't go through it in too much detail, but we also know that there are particular changes that essentially take out one of the two copies of the gene, either as a deletion or some other things that we know disrupt the gene. So we can see a couple different types of changes in the gene. At this point, we don't know if there might be specific features or whether the condition is milder or more severe based on the underlying change in the gene that an individual has. So I'm gonna put every one together in one bucket for now. That is that for the sake of being able to see patterns, I've put every one together with changes um, that are either missense or any of these other types of changes all together in one group. Okay, so here are the data in terms of thinking about what this means for individuals in terms of their body and their brain and their health and their behavior. So the most common things that we see are things that I'll say are above the shoulders. And what I mean by that is they're largely things that are related to the brain and how the brain is functioning and how that relates to learning, being able to develop new skills and how it relates to behavior. In general, this condition is something that I'll call um, non-progressive. So what I mean by that is that children, as they're developing, continue to gain new skills, they continue to develop, they continue to mature, and that's true as well for CSNK2A1. Uh, at this point, we may have times where there are skills that need a lot of reinforcement, a lot of repetition to be able to learn the skill, but we still see forward progress. 
what we haven't seen so far with CSNK2A1 is what I'll call regression or falling back down the slope or losing those skills, at least not when they're permanently attained. So what do I mean by that? When an individual learns, for instance, to be able to walk, what we're seeing is that once walking is solid, um, they're not losing that skill over time. Now, of course, everyone has a bad day. So there might be a day when that skill wasn't 100% achieved and there might be a bad day where they don't seem to be able to do that skill quite as well. There might be times when people are sick and they take a little bit of a setback. Um, but in general, this is a non-progressive condition where people continue to do better in terms of learning more skills over time. However, there are gaps between what this individual can do with CSNK2A1 and what another peer might do, another brother or sister, for instance, of the same age that didn't have the condition. And that gap can sometimes feel like it widens over time because the differences between our kiddos and other kiddos that are uh, peers of the same age may be greater over time. So the things that we see are things that are relatively common in terms of neurodevelopmental disorders, delays in terms of time of sitting and walking and talking and being able to do many of the self-help skills or reading or writing or math. Um, some of those skills are delayed. Some of those skills may not realistically be achievable, at least not based on current technology, but a lot of individuals report to me in particular um, that their children, for instance, understand a lot more than they can sometimes be able to express. So being able to get that information in, process it, um, much of that is going on, but being able to articulate or say specific things can be harder. So just keep that in mind. I think our kids are always listening to us and absorbing things like a sponge. Um, behavioral issues can also be something, and that's in part because of um, what I think is need for consistency or at least feeling more comfortable and secure with consistency, less surprises. So as an example, um, many of our kiddos have been diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder, about 25% of them. Um, many of the kiddos have also been diagnosed as they get a little bit older with attention deficit hyperactivity, so about 20% of them. And for some individuals, they can have issues with anxiety. Um, with new situations, they can um, you know, be, be disturbing or be disruptive. There are some individuals that have more than one of these conditions. So as you'll notice, these numbers add up to more than 100% because there can be some individuals, as I said, who might have, for instance, anxiety and ADHD. Um, in terms of their cognitive capacity, we technically say that um, younger children, we classify them as developmentally delayed and older children as intellectual disability. And the majority of individuals in our group had either developmental delay or intellectual disability. There was one or the other, um, and that diagnosis is really made depending on the age of the participant. So that, that's the main and consistent feature. We see everyone in the cohort who at least had one of the things that were on that last slide. So one of the important things for me as a pediatrician, if I have a child that has uh, issues in terms of the way the brain's working and absorbing information, is to make sure that all of the channels coming into the brain are working as well as possible. So I try and work with families to make sure that the senses, especially including vision, and hearing are working as well as they can. Um, and that's so that people can accurately see the world around them, take that information in, and so that especially as they're developing language and understanding things, that that's coming in clearly, that it's crisp, they can, don't have trouble, trouble in terms of being able to understand what people are saying. So why is this especially important for our community? Um, for CSK and 2A1, um, it's especially important for the eyes because many people have one or another problem in terms of vision. It's quite common for the kiddos. Um, there are different types of things that we can see. They're largely focused around the eye themselves or itself. Um, there are some things in the brain, in the back of the brain, that's responsible for processing the visual information. Um, but the reason I say a lot of it's in the eyes is because the doctors that take care of that are pediatric ophthalmologists, largely, or eye doctors. Um, some of these things you can notice just by observing your child at home, and some of them, it may take someone who can 
very carefully and knows what they're looking for, be able to see evidence of problems with the eyes. And these are, um, again, things that can be treated or corrected, and so we don't want to miss these. Um, so there are various things that you might see. The eye doctor usually is uh, the one that sees astigmatism. It's not something that you or I can see simply by just looking at a child across the room. Um, but something like cross eye or lazy eye or strabismus might be something that you would see uh, in terms of an eye that's turning out or turning in. And if you're starting to see that uh, consistently, it's something that I would take your child to the eye doctor to be able to get checked out. Um, like I said, there are things like cortical blindness, uh, which is not common. So we saw just one kiddo with this. That's not a problem with the eye itself, but really the information in the brain that receives the input from the eyes and then processes it. So there can be issues mostly with the eye, but occasionally with the brain in terms of receiving that. And then one other thing um, that, again, you may or may not notice in terms of looking at the eye, but there may be a small defect in uh, the, the coloring of the eye. So the part of the eye that has the color called the iris, sometimes there may be a very small and very subtle defect in terms of uh, a gap that may look black instead of if someone had blue eyes, instead of it being blue all around the iris, a little gap where that may look black. Um, that in and of itself may not cause problems with vision, but it may um, tell us that there's something else that has developed not quite right in the rest of the eye in the back area as well. So that's important to, if you see something in the front, to make sure someone's looking at the back of the eye as well. Um, in addition, we can sometimes see manifestations in other parts of the body that reflect what's going on in the brain. So as an example, almost everyone had problems with low muscle tone, or sometimes called hypotonia. That low muscle tone can manifest as low truncal tone, um, problems in terms of being looser, not feeling quite as strong, um, and individuals may have difficulty in terms of their movements. And I see this all the time in terms of kids that may be more clumsy, they may trip and fall more, they may seem less coordinated, um, where more complicated movements, they may have trouble knowing where their body is in space and, and being able to move sort of seamlessly or flow seamlessly. It may look uh, not quite as much like a ballet dancer as someone who um, needs a little bit more practice. Um, within all of this though, these are things that can be helped, um, certainly in terms of practice makes perfect. And so we have what I call motor memory. That is that as you're practicing activities, as you're practicing walking upstairs, um, you eventually get better at it. Both you get stronger, oftentimes with physical therapy, and simply with practice, you can help in terms of the coordination with whatever that movement is. Um, in many cases, physical therapists can be quite helpful with this. I know right now I'm giving this talk under what's an unusual time in history in terms of SARS-CoV-2 and this COVID-19 pandemic. So I know not everyone has had uh, access to physical therapists as often as we might like to or with as much in-person direction. Um, but I will say that physical therapists in usual circumstances can be quite helpful with these types of issues. Um, and so if those of you who had physical therapists but may not write exactly at this moment, it is helpful to continue doing as much as you can, either with the therapist coming in remotely via video conference or with what they may have taught you to do to continue reinforcing that with your child. Um, with this condition, it is certainly not the majority. In other words, it's only about 40%, uh, but we do see epilepsy as something in uh, more than just by chance alone. I'm sure the seizures are a manifestation of this condition in some individuals. Seizures can come in many different types. Some of them are more obvious than others. Grand mal seizures um, are big seizures, so to speak. They're often associated with movements, so movements in terms of the arms or the legs, um, but things that are hard to miss. And about a quarter of individuals have had seizures like that. I will say any one person can have more than one seizure type. So it could be that on one day you have one seizure type, on another day or with medication you might have another seizure type. Um, in contrast though, there are many individuals that have, instead of big seizures, little seizures or petit mal seizures. These are ones that are much more subtle and can easily be missed. It almost looks like someone's zoning out. Um, and so they may stare off into space and you may not know for sure even that it's a seizure, um, except that they're staring off and it's hard to bring them back. You can't just sort of 
bring them back in by clapping or, you know, sort of waving in front of their eyes. They seem to be in another world, and sometimes after that can, see, can seem like they're out of it. There may be um, what we call a post-ictal period or a period afterwards where their brain is still not quite back to normal. Um, within this, there can also be some other seizure types that are a little bit more complicated. They're not as frequent. Uh, thankfully, infantile spasms, which can be uh, certainly much earlier onset and scarier, are not something that we frequently see. And as I'll get to it in a little while, the seizures are largely treatable with medication, and it's pretty standard medication that we're using for seizures. Um, there are other parts of the body, though, that are affected. Um, they're still, in some cases, ultimately controlled by the brain, but they manifest in other places. And uh, stomach issues or gastrointestinal issues are some of those. Um, there are nerves that go from the brain to the intestine, and so I think that's part of the reason for the connection. Um, sometimes things go real fast through the intestine. Sometimes they go real slow through the intestine. Again, some of the nerves going in and causing the intestine to contract um, may either make them contract really, really fast and sometimes lead to diarrhea or may make it slower and lead to constipation. Um, some individuals have both and on different days have different manifestations. Um, for this, we do see that for uh, heartburn or reflux, it does respond to standard kind of medications that we use for that. And for diarrhea and constipation, in large part, um, families find ways in terms of dietary intervention or in some cases stool softeners or laxatives or something to be able to help things move along. Um, in terms of infections, I would say Infections are um, an area that I'd like to hear more from this community about specifically. Um, I, I hear two things, and let me summarize that. I hear number one, that kiddos have sort of the usual type of infections that we see in childhood. That is, we see ear infections, um, you know, things that are in the chest, sometimes pneumonia, um, but I would call those kind of routine. Uh, our kiddos, I think, sometimes take longer than usual to get back to normal, to regain their strength and to uh, fight that cold or that infection or that ear infection. Um, but I'm, I am reserving uh, this last line. That is that um, it's not very often, but I do hear just a little bit more that there might be something more that's a uh, more serious type of infection or something that um, may be more than just a cold, maybe more than just an ear infection, but that's a more serious immunodeficiency. Again, I'm not seeing it in the majority of individuals, and it's only two individuals out of our uh, 20 or 21 in the series. So it's still a small percentage, but when I see something twice, it makes me pause. So if there are any of you out there that are seeing something similar like that, um, we're interested in that in particular to understand that better. So I'm gonna move on to the treatment side of things because families often ask me about this. I would say the treatments that folks have used in terms of surgery are for the most part regular sort of things that pediatric surgeons and ear, ear doctors are used to. So things like ear tubes when there are too many ear infections, um, surgeries to tack down the testicles if there are undescended testes. So things that are not too sort of, they're pretty standard. Um, rarely, there will be something like craniosynostosis. So if the sutures of the skull fuse too early, there's a surgery that we use to be able to separate those. And so it's only one child, but we have seen that once. And whether or not that's related to this or just coincidental, I don't know yet because it's just been one case. Um, I haven't seen much else. So we have rarely seen what I would say are very minor heart issues. This could just be um, a hole in the heart um, that doesn't re require surgery. It didn't in this case. A valve that may be a little bit floppy and have some what we call regurgitation. I don't think these are serious problems that we're seeing, and it's certainly not something that we're having to treat with medication or with surgery. Um, on the other hand, something that we are consistently seeing are growth issues. Um, growth issues in terms of difficulty with growing to be tall, as well as gaining weight. And in some cases, both of those in the same person. Um, I don't think these are things like growth hormone deficiencies. So I don't think it's something where the body is missing the signal to grow. I think the underlying instruction set is to grow to be a smaller size. So I think that's part and related to the underlying genetic difference. What I often tell pediatricians is that to monitor growth, 
the weight should be proportionate to the height. And the pediatrician, when they measure the growth in the office, um, can be able to see is the weight approximately what it should be for how tall the person is. We don't want someone to be too skinny. We don't want them to be too chubby. And so there's a way to get it just right. And no matter how tall you are, your pediatrician can look at those ratios to see whether or not that the nutrition is appropriate for how tall the person is mentioned this a little bit before, but among the males, um, it was not uncommon to see these undescended testicles. If those don't come down on their own, there's a real simple surgery to be able to just surgically get them where they should be, and that prevents future uh, cancer of the testicle. So it's important to get that treated surgically if the testes aren't coming down. Um, finally, as I said, we uh, rarely but have certain other bone problems. One of the bone problems I want to point out is scoliosis or curvature of the spine. That's much more common in adolescents or teenage years, and so something your pediatrician can keep an eye on. It's common with individuals with low muscle tone generally, not just specific to this condition. Um, we weren't very commonly seeing autoimmune diseases, but we did see one problem, uh, one person rather, with a problem with the thyroid gland. So that's something we're keeping an eye on. And as I said, when we think about the different medicines that people have used, they pretty much go along with the types of symptoms or conditions that I've been mentioning. So as I said, um, it's not a huge number for any one of these, but we do find that medicines can be helpful for things like seizures, helping with those tummy problems that I mentioned, certain behavioral issues uh, and attention deficit, for instance, um, or, and these are pretty routine things, I think, for common conditions like asthma or allergies. Um, with this, there hasn't necessarily been one medication that's been the answer to everything. What I would say is so far we're seeing that the usual medications that we use for other individuals with these same conditions in general um, are as helpful for CSNK2A1. Um, I know this is a question that commonly comes up, so I wanted to address the issue of seizures specifically. Um, these are some of the medications that have been used for seizures. Again, there's no not been one clear winner in terms of how to use uh, what specific medication to use for seizures, but if any of the doctors are looking in, um, this is what others have used. So just to briefly summarize, Again, most of the issues we're seeing are related fundamentally to the brain and how the brain is functioning. Certainly the interaction with other parts of the body, whether the eyes, the stomach, or muscle tone, um, but primarily related to that. And as I said, an important take home point, this is not underscore not a progressive condition. It's something where children continue to gain milestones, continue to develop and continue to gain new skills. Just finally, if there are any researchers watching who would like to be able to get access to any of these data for their research, to be able to potentially uh, see if there are cell lines that might be helpful to your research, you can go up here on the upper left-hand corner is the URL where you can go to request the data. And all we need to do is make sure you have a research distribution agreement in place and an account set up. And one of the individuals on the team will be glad to help you fill that request. So I thank you for your time and uh, hope this has been helpful and look forward to working with the community on an ongoing basis. Great, and thanks to Wendy for that great presentation. Um, we have our first question, but I just wanna quickly let everyone know that we may not have time to get to every question today. However, we are going to go back to the presenters and get answers for any questions that are submitted. So if we run out of time and don't answer your question, don't worry, we will provide an answer later. Um, and with that, the first question is, in regard to growth and stature, we are considering starting our son on HGH shots. You mentioned that this condition can sometimes cause the body not to recognize the HGH signals, but rather just the body growing smaller. What would be your opinion on starting HGH shots to help our child grow? Currently as a six-year-old, he is 4.32 standard deviations below a standard growth chart. Very good. So for those who don't know what this is, this is human growth hormone. Um, so the question is, will you know growth hormone sort of normalize growth? Um, my guess is if you and your endocrinologist go through what they call a growth hormone stimulation test, that that will be normal. I haven't seen anyone who's been deficient in growth hormone where their body doesn't make that. If you are deficient in growth hormone, then definitely HGH or human growth hormone is the way to go. That should normalize growth. 
On the other hand, if you're not deficient in growth hormone, then oftentimes what I see, and this is not specific just for this condition, but it's true actually of many genetic conditions that are like this, um, you can front load growth. So you can have an early growth spurt that's stimulated by this growth hormone. Um, it's not clear to us how much final adult height you will increase by doing that. So in other words, do you just simply shift more growth earlier and then it, you have less growth later? Um, my guess is that you probably will get a little bit of additional growth. Um, so you'll kind of override the system. I'm not sure yet whether a little bit of growth is going to translate into one inch or a couple centimeters or something like three inches um, or something like five or six centimeters. I think it's going to be in that neighborhood. I don't think you're going to gain something like six inches, 12 inches or completely normalized growth. Um, it is an injection and it is something that at least in the United States, um, insurance companies have very specific guidelines that you have to meet to be able to qualify for that. So definitely work with your endocrinologist in that evaluation. Thanks. Um, this next question is, disrupted sleep and circadian rhythms can contribute to many of the symptoms you discussed. Have you included questions related to this in your screening? Yes, so um, this is a great question and um, circadian rhythms oftentimes parents will tell us are treating with melatonin um, as something to be able to help. It's a medication that's over the counter, uh, so you don't even need a prescription for that. We do query sleep, um, so we do have questions that specifically are asking about sleep questions um, and sleep disruption or problems with sleep, and it is, I would say, something that we see with fair frequency, um, and that may be due to, as you said, underlying problems with circadian rhythms. Okay, and um, this next question, what is the common treatment option for low muscle tone? So I think um, the low muscle tone is really emanating from the brain, so it's not a problem with the muscle per se. Um, and we don't have a way of centrally being able to fix that, but the way we commonly deal with this is with physical therapy. And so many of you have therapists who are helping in terms of core muscle strength, so the trunk especially, but also the arms and the legs, and it's a matter of practice, practice, practice. So it's um, therapy and it's, if you will, working out, um, but working in terms of trying to just increase the muscle mass and, and hopefully increase the muscle tone in that way. Thank you. Um, and the next question, how are you trying to increase the number of patients in the CSNK2A1 group? For example, patients described in Climver or Decipher. Yep, that's a great question. Um, really, it's through you all. Um, it's through word of mouth. So um, the what people are referring to here is that there are publicly available but de-identified um, places where information can be, uh, scientists, for instance, can look at information. Um, we don't know who any of those people are, so we can't reach out to them and invite them to join the study or be part of this, but you can. Um, and so uh, phone a friend, um, let someone else know on Facebook, um, spread the word, and certainly we, will, we, we would love to hear from you if there are either specific questions, as you've been asking, that are of particular importance and or uh, ways to make this easier for you to participate. Thanks. Um, this person is asking, my daughter has recently been diagnosed with OCNS. I understand from reading the literature that there are about 60 children with the condition. The studies discussed only refer to 21 children. When are the results you discussed from? Yep. Um, so in terms of this, and I, I'm sorry, this may have been confusing, the 21 individuals that I discussed are individuals who are in Simon Searchlight, who have gone through the entire process of consenting, providing their genetic test report to review, and then actually filling out those, um, or talking to us on the phone and telling us about their children. Um, we do know of additional individuals who haven't gone through that whole process yet. And if you're one of those people that are stuck at some point, um, perhaps Lindsay or someone else, if they haven't already, can put in the chat box um, the uh, URL to be able to go and continue your journey on Simon Searchlight. We do know that there are other people out there, um, some of whom, like I said, who have registered with us, some of whom um, may not have heard about Simon Searchlight, and, and I'll also be fair, some people who aren't interested in participating in research, and of that, of course, is fine as well. Um, I also do know that there are some individuals who may not even know their results who've been reported in the literature. My hope is that those studies will get that information back to those participants so that they can, just for themselves, uh, know what's going on and hopefully be able to join this community. 
Thank you. Um, and I, for everyone listening, I did put the searchlight, uh, the Simon searchlight URL in the chat box. Um, and then this question, which I think will be our last question before we're going to have to move on to the next presentation. My daughter has the habit of sucking a cloth very frequently, more like for comfort. Is similar behavior seen in other kids? Yep. So I've personally seen this quite frequently. Um, what I'll oftentimes see is children that will take the edge of their shirt and suck on that, or maybe their sleeve or a cloth. Um, I think it's soothing for them. It's something that's consistent. Um, and like I said, is able to just calm them down and sort of get them in a zone. So that is fairly frequent. Thank you, Dr. Trump. Um, so now I want to introduce our next presenter. Um, Heike received her master's degree in biochemistry from the Free University Berlin, Germany. She went on to do a PhD at University College London Department of Biochemistry, working on kinases and performing mass spectrometrical analysis of phosphocytes. For her postdoctoral work, she joined the laboratory of Nobel laureate Dr. Green, Dr. Paul Greengard at Rockefeller University, New York, where her interest in CK2 was ignited. She found that CK2 modulates certain neurotransmitter receptors in the brain, which led to work, work in the fields of Parkinson's disease and major depression, as well as the generation of conditional knockout mice. She continued this research while being a research assistant professor at CUNY Medical School Department of Physiology, Pharmacology, and Neuroscience, as well as while being an a independent principal investigator at, um, and I may pronounce, mispronounce this, Universita Catacola del Sacro Cor. Um, and since last year, as group leader of the Laboratory of Signaling Mechanisms in Neurological Disorders at the Institut de Psychiatry at De Neurosciences, De Paris, University de Paris. Uh, so here is her talk. Yes, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Heike Repuls and I am working in, in Paris on the OCNDS project. And some of you have already met two years ago at the parents conference. And I just wanted be to, before starting my, my presentation, I wanted to you know, say how, how uh, important it is for me to work on this and how, how, um, how I'm very happy and very engaged to be part of uh, your community, your patient community. So I'm going to talk about um, CK2 uh, from a maybe biochemical standpoint and uh, because we are working on trying to understand what the individual mutations that occur on, on CK2 to cause OCNDS actually do to the protein uh, CK2 on a more biochemical level. So um, CK2, as you know, um, is um, the name for a protein called casein kinase 2. And just, you know, as a little entry point, I'm telling you, a, a protein is a three-dimensional assembly of amino acid chains. And on top, CK2 is not only a protein, but it is an enzyme. An enzyme means it's a type of protein that has an, a job to do in the cell, a sort of an activity. Like it, it, it is not just there passively, but it has a job to do. And so CK2 is one of these proteins that are actively doing something in the cell. And what does it do? CK2, as the name says, is a kinase. Uh, and kinases, their job is to transfer a phosphate group, that's a chemical entity, let's call it, a phosphate entity from one molecule to another receiving protein. So why CK2 is a protein? It also transfers a phosphate group, like this chemical entity, from one molecule to another protein. And by doing so, this protein that has received um, the phosphate group will change in its structure and very possibly in its function. So uh, a kinase does a very important job by doing that because this phosphorylation is a, a means by which proteins can be regulated in a very, very fast manner. And kinase regulation by kinases is a very important means of regulation in every cell. Um, very, very important, very fast and very concise. So that means also that kinases themselves need to be controlled in a, in a, you know, in a, in a very uh, good manner. They need, their activity needs to be 
controlled. Otherwise, the proteins that are depending on the kinase activity will also be deregulated. So kinases are important and kinase activity is a very important regulatory mechanism for many, many processes that occur in the cell. Um, background on CK2, um, you see here on that slide that um, it is a big molecule and it contains actually four amino acid chains, not just one, but it contains four. So it's called a heterotetramer, whereby we see two alpha subunits, catalytic subunits, and two beta subunits. So these are part of CK2. Um, and these beta subunits, they do not have kinase activity. They're not actually doing the job, but they have a job in terms of holding this complex together. Um, so alpha can also be alpha prime. Um, they're very similar. This alpha subunit and the so-called alpha prime subunit are very similar in their function, in their structure. However, they're encoded by two different genes. So what we see on OCNDS is only so far, are, are only so far mutations on the gene that encodes for the alpha subunit. Okay, you'll see later um, what uh, about those mutations. I'll show you in a second. So regulations that are mediated or controlled by CK2 are widespread. We know CK2 is expressed everywhere in the body and therefore it has multiple jobs to do, right? CK2 can affect cell growth, division, metabolism, communications from one cell to another, cell shape, structure, and importantly, it has been highly studied in its role in cancers. I'll, I'll show you a slide very soon. Most um, timely here is that there was a paper recently, or a couple of papers that involved CK2 also in COVID-19, in the disease COVID-19. Um, oops, sorry. So uh, CK2 is encoded by a gene termed CSNK2A1. I think hence is also the name of the foundation CSNK2A1. And what you, what's the case for every protein it is encoded, it is the blueprint for each protein is in, the, in its DNA, in its gene. So every protein has a gene um, that then will be translated into a protein. And what happens sometimes is that when a gene or the DNA is duplicated, like for example, when a cell is getting ready to divide, then sometimes mistakes occur, which we call mutations, where the building blocks of the DNA are not correctly, correctly replaced. And usually um, that can be repaired by the, by the cellular system, by a repair system, but sometimes that doesn't happen. And then we have really mutations that are gonna last in that cell or in the organism where the cell is gonna grow into or what, that the cell is gonna grow into. For example, if a mutation happens very early in development, very early or even in the oocyte or the sperm, then uh, an organism will be really continuing to have this mutation. And this is what happens in inherited, um, genetically inherited um, diseases um, or, or conditions such as OCNDS. Um, what happens when, when a mutation occurs? Well, it can lead to a different amino acid being put into the amino acid chain and different amino acids occupy different molecular spaces and have different electrostatic charges and therefore they will impact on the three-dimensional structure of a protein and change the structure and thereby most possibly the function of a, a protein. And this is um, what, we're, what we want to study for CK2, like what happens when these specific OCNDS mutation occur, occur, what happens to the activity of CK2. And what you have here is just to show you a slide to show you how um, important CK2 is in the brain. It is expressed everywhere in the brain. I have here um, on the left, you see CK2 alpha is stained in this um, brain slice from a mouse brain. CK2 alpha prime is stained for and CK2 beta and alpha is, so the, the main isoform alpha is present really almost in, in quasi in every cell, whereas alpha and alpha prime and beta, they have some regions or some cell types where we cannot detect them. Um, I told you before that CK2 is overexpressed in, in cancer. So it seems to be, um, or that, that it plays a role in cancers. And it seems to be that you, you know, a certain amount of CK2 is important. Um, and when, when um, 
when uh, you have too much, this is not really good for an organism. And most possibly when there's too little, we also see uh, problems. Let's talk first about the too much. In many cancers, as you see here on that list, starting from bladder cancer, over breast cancer, lung cancer, we see that CK2 alpha, the catalytic isoform, the catalytic form of CK2 is overexpressed, is upregulated. That means more CK2 is being made in these cancers. And it is known by now that this um, altered um, prevalence or expression of CK2 confers to the cells um, a growth advantage. So it helps the cancer grow more, grow faster and be um, less susceptible to, to agents that might kill the cancer cells. And um, there are currently clinical trials ongoing where CK2 inhibitors, so drugs that, that stop CK2 activity are being used to reduce cancer growth. And in some or in many cases, these inhibitors have been shown uh, to be effective in reducing cancer growth. Uh, just briefly, because it might interest you, because I said before, CK2 is involved in COVID-19 or has been published. It seems to be that um, the virus and CK2, they occupy the same spots in the cell. And uh, it is hypothesized that CK2 is being exploited by the virus to make more, to help make more of the virus and to release it onto other cells. So once it has been amplified, the virus, it has to be released from a cell to then infect more cells. And CK2 seems to be involved in this later process, which is kind of interesting. And um, in, in these papers that are published, the authors, of course, claim that potentially inhibiting CK2 with drugs might be a way forward in treating COVID-19. Um, so what happens, but when, when we have the other situation, when we lack CK2, well, we can study that in mice or in other animal models where we basically ablate a gene from being expressed. That means we ablate CK2 from being there in the organism. And I just give you one example, the CK2 alpha knockout mouse was made, meaning the mouse um, that doesn't have any CK2 expressed in none of the tissues, CK2 alpha was made already a while ago uh, in 2008, and it was not viable. That means uh, the, the embryos die before birth because they have severe defects in heart and lung, uh, no, in, in heart and, and the neural tube, which will develop into the brain. Okay, but when, however, 50% of CK2 is still there, um, then the mice are totally fine, viable, and healthy, and they don't show any behavioral, gross behavioral deficits. So it seems to be a matter of dose, as I, as I mentioned before. If you have too much, not so good. You might, um, you might um, you know, amplify yourself too much, which is a sign of cancer. If you have nothing, that's not good. You are, um, and our organism cannot live without CK2. But if you have half of the CK2 that a healthy organism has, you're already, um, the, the organism is, is viable and on the first glance healthy. Um, there are also conditional knockout um, mice made for CK2 alpha and alpha prime. Um, these were made by our lab. And uh, what, what these mean is that you can knock out CK2 specifically in cell types, for example, of the brain that you're interested in. So that means the cells or the, the organism is viable because CK2 is present almost everywhere except in one cell type that one wants to study, for example, in the brain. That's what we did. And this is, um, I think, quite interesting when we have a specific conditional knockout. So when we knock out CK2 in one set of cells in the, what we call forebrain, um, we, we get a behavioral phenotype. So we get behaviors that are in many ways, ways uh, reminiscent of OCNDS symptoms. So let me give you a few examples, for example, um, you know, patients with OCNDS often exhibit hyperactive behavior. And that we see also in one of the mice that we made, which is this one here. So they are hyperactive when they're tested for, yeah, for activity. Some other mice, however, that we made are not hyperactive. So it seems to be really that CK2 plays specific roles in, 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 uh, in specific cells that leads to certain behaviors that could also then, I mean, we could extrapolate from there 
that it is important um, to um, think of maybe therapies or understanding OCNDS by focusing on these type of cells that give us, when they don't have CK2, a behavioral, um, a behavioral um, how can I say, print that, that somehow reminds of OCNDS. Other symptoms we, we, um, that one can attribute to OCNDS are these tics or stereotypies, so behaviors like um, quick movements, um, very, very fast movements and that are uncontrolled. Uh, the mice that we studied have that as well. Sleeping difficulties um, have been observed in some OCNDS um, patients, um, so that they're just not sleeping through the night or not going to bed before very, very late. Um, and we see also in our mice uh, changes in circadian rhythm, uh, whereby the mice are much more active when they should be sleeping and less active when um, during the wake time. So we have intellectual impairment, obviously. This is one of the cornerstones of OCNDS symptomatology. And the knockout mice, the conditional knockout mice that we studied, have also um, decreased memory capacity. And we did a couple of tests to find that out. They have, so patients, um, you know, some of the patients, um, OCNDS patients, or all of them have a delayed motor development, that's clear, and some have um, motor development or motor problems until late in life. And we can reproduce that somehow uh, by motor testing them, by, by testing the mice for their motor capacities, which are reduced as well. Um, so here, um, Probably Dr. Chung has shown you already a slide like this, where um, CK2, the structure of CK2 is, 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 is put here from the beginning to the end, and the mutants, the mutations that have been found in patients all over the world. And um, it is clear that many of these mutations do occur in areas of the, of the enzyme of um, CK2 that are crucial for its kinase activity. And this is why, um, why uh, and also the fact that there, is a, there are patients who have lost the whole gene of CK2, um, which obviously leads to no CK2 being present um, and indicates that for these patients, at least, there will be less activity of CK2 in, in each cell. You have to know that when, when I'm saying um, a mutation occurs or the deletion of the CK2 gene occurs, this is only in one copy of your chromosome, of the chromosomes of the patient. And therefore you have never, or an OCNDS patient has never a full loss of CK2. They definitely have 50% of CK2 activity, but most probably much more than that, or more than that. The minimum they, they, they lose, or they, the minimum they have is 50%, and then they have the activity that stems from the copy with the mutation. And so the, 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 the question is how to, de uh, to determine the um, amount of um, activity that is present or the, the um, degree of activity that is present in these mutants when compared to non-mutated, we call it wild type protein. We've actually done this. Um, we've um, we've uh, worked with, um, these mutants, we've made all these mutants, and we have tested for um, activity, and we find that um, activity is differently um, affected um, in different mutants. But that overall, the hypothesis can be confirmed that uh, CK2 reduction or loss of function is uh, causing a phenotype. Um, a phenotype means um, behavioral, you know, um, the symptomatology that it underlies what we what we what we see. Um, so th this is uh, one piece of data that we've recently gotten. We've also um, tested the different mutants here that are indicated here for their expression for their position in cells, and we can also say that means so when when you when you when you put these mutants into cells. We look at where do they live, where do they localize, and um, they can be either localized to the nucleus because in every cell there is a nucleus that contains DNA and things that are, are needed to multiply to to um, divide DNA, etc. And then we have um, the cytoplasm where metabolism, signaling, and many other 
um, other things happen. And um, so we, we found that different mutants have in part different localization in the, in the, in the cell. Which is um, which is very interesting and which will uh, need which will need to be um, followed up further. Um, for example, one mutant will um, also change the morphology of the cells. So that could mean that in in this type of mutant we have different um, um, ways how the cell migrates, how they move, how they extend. Um, Etc. So this is something we're we're testing currently, um, and we've done mass spectrometry, another method to assess the phosphorylation activity of CK2 in the mutants. And for this, we actually received fibroblasts from you, from some of the patients uh, through um, TGen, which is um, collaborating with us, or we're we're thankful to be collaborating with them, um, and we found that phosphorylation activity by CK2 is reduced in the patient cells. Again, indicating what has been hypothesized is that um, CK2 activity is reduced in cells derived from OCNDS patients. So where are we going? Um, we are gonna keep working doing the same assessments with more patient cells because whatever we've done with with uh, animal cells, for example, we work with monkey cells or with mouse cells, and then we put in the mutation, the mutant protein, we call it exogenously, we bring it in, but it's never the same than when you work with a protein that is normally expressed. So patient cells are gonna give us much more relevant, much more true information than working in a system where you introduce something that normally doesn't belong there. So we're getting from a Simons Foundation very soon, hopefully, more, 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 patient, more patient as well as blood cells with which we can make sure that our hypothesis that we, um, that we built through our, what is called in vitro studies, so studies with other cells like monkey cells, et cetera, um, that they're really true and uh, hold the case still for, for the human cells and for the human disease. So that's looking at activity, of CK2, morphology, that means the shape of the cell, ability to migrate of, of cells, and we're gonna again uh, use more cells to, 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 um, to mine um, the, um, the effects of the CK2 on, on those, all those phosphorylated proteins within a cell. Because CK2 is one kinase and then there are many other kinases, but we, we know which, uh, which uh, substrates actually, which proteins are substrates for CK2. So when we do mass spectrometrical analysis, we can look exactly for those proteins that we know should theoretically, theoretically be phosphorylated by the kinase CK2. And then we can see in those patient cells if those have reduced phosphorylation um, extents or, or, or not. We're gonna also work with patient-derived iPS cells. Again, will be provided by uh, Simon's Foundation. And uh, what are iPS cells? Well, these are cells that are basically, they stem from the skin again, but then they are made through a reprogramming um, technology. They're being turned into cells that can be differentiated, that can be turned into other cells. For example, we're interested in the brain, obviously, so we're gonna, turn these cells that originally stem from the skin of patients, we can turn them into neurons, so into brain cells. And that's very important because we believe that the CK2, um, you know, OCNDS, I mean, is, a, is mainly a disease that's driven by, 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 by you know, developmental delay in, in brain development and in, in, in brain function. So we need to understand what happens in cells derived from patients when they're turned into brain cells. Are these cells, looking the same? Are these cells generating projections? Are they, are they communicating with other cells a similar way? And how do they respond to stimuli? Like what happens in the brain? Cells will always get stimuli and need to respond to stimuli. Do those patient-derived cells do the same job than, a patient, uh, than, than cells derived from healthy patients? So this is what we're gonna study with iPS cells. And finally, 
And most importantly, we're going to work with knock-in mice. What does that mean? Um, so uh, it means uh, we're working with one or on one mutation that causes CK2, as uh, OCNDS, excuse me, K198R. And this, as you most probably know, is one of the mutations that um, occur most commonly, or it's the most common OCNDS causing mutation. And so it's the first one that we need to study, the first um, mouse. And this mouse basically is genetically very comparable to an OCNDS patient because it has on one of the two chromosomes the mutation, but not on the other. It has it from conception onwards. Um, it has it through the whole development and into uh, adult life. We have these mice in the lab, they're viable. Um, they're growing, they're becoming adults, they're, they can reproduce. And um, we're gonna do a big panel, I'm showing you just some experiments here, to assess the behavior of these mice. First of all, are they the same than the knockout mice that I told you about in the beginning, which have you know changes in the ticks, in the locomotion, in the stereotypy, in the learning um, cap capacity to learn, in their motor development, all of that we're going to test again in those new mice, which are much more relevant as a model to OCNDS because they're, they were really made to be a model of OCNDS. They really mirror the, the human genetics. And so we're going to test them uh, for their locomotion, you know, for the, we're, we're going to put them into a um, container, let's say, and we let them run at free will and we measure how they run, I mean, we measure their path and how much distance they cover in, in a given amount of time. We can also assess uh, more things. We, we film those mice and we, we observe their behavior such as grooming and these um, uncontrolled movements, etc. cetera. Uh, we will also test, well, we will do as before the motor skills. This is here in the bottom right, you see it's like a moving rod and mice um, will be put on that rod and they have to learn to adapt to that rod that's turning slow and then faster and faster and faster. And they, they get a lot of practice to do that. And we learn, uh, we assess how quickly they, they can perform better. Uh, we give them a few um, days to learn and we give them many sessions to learn. And so we can compare if there are differences in motor learning uh, by this paradigm. We will assess their memory through a variety of tests. Like here, for example, the mouse is put in a maze and it has to kind of explore all those three arms. Similarly, if it always um, does only one or the same, then it might not really, it might have a spatial memory issue. But we, we're having other tests to, to, um, to um, assess the same question, just to be sure. Um, we're testing for mood because um, in our lab, we have previously shown that um, lack of CK2 in these knockout mice that I've previously described also affects um, mood. And um, I've also spoken to some parents and they actually told me that their kids are very happy, positive kids. And this is also what we see in our knockout mice. We see that the knockout mice, the conditional knockout mice are less depressed like, we call that like that in, in, in our field, but it just means that they're they're rather happy mice, mm -hmm. and there are a few tests to assess a mood in, in mice, and we're, we're going we're gonna to do that in those new 198R knock-in mice as well, to see if they are also less depressed, i.e. more happy than the litter mates that don't have the mutation. For example, we put them here in a, in a bucket with water, and we test how long, t how, long how much time it takes for them to give up to try and escape that situation by climbing up um, on the wall of the, of the beaker, of the water beaker. That's just one example. And then we're assessing sociability by putting the mice um, into contact with um, mice that they don't know. And we're going to investigate how much time this, for example, here, that I don't know if you see my cursor, but how much time a mouse, um, our test mouse, is uh, interacting with a novel mouse as compared to, for example, how much time does it interact with a building block? Uh, or how much time does it devote to a new mouse that's been introduced as opposed to a mouse that's already been, um, that the mouse already knows? So these are just a few behavioral tests to show you how we're gonna try and see if these new mice 
have a, a phenotype, we call it, have behaviors that can be somehow related to the human symptoms and also um, that can help us to then later try to assess whether drugs, gene therapy, other manipulations that we, we will do can um, do something to revert these behaviors. For example, the changes in circadian rhythm, can they be reverted by giving a drug that enhances CK2 activity, for example, I'm making this up, or if we reintroduce by so-called gene therapy, if we reintroduce um, more CK2 in the brain, do we actually affect the motor skills? This type of thing we need to find for, for working with, with, a, um, with a question of trying to see if there, there is a potential cure. And I don't wanna make the word cure sound you know, like it's it's uh, it's happening right now. But but just in general, you need to have an, an animal model where you can study improvement or even not improvement, but where you can where you have things that you can study. And the mouse will will do just that. Hopefully, it will give us a phenotype, a behavior that we can study and test before and after intervention. So um, with the mice, we also, of course, will do our biochemical experiments which means we're testing for CK2 activity. We're looking where CK2 is living in, in every single cell. Does it live in the nucleus? Does it, li does it live in the cytoplasm outside of the nucleus? We're gonna check whether CK2 subunits are actually altered, whether the balance of expression, of presence of these subunits, alpha, alpha prime and beta is altered. And we want to study importantly, because we're neuroscientists, uh, we want to study brain functioning. And here's just a brain, um, here are just two neurons that we know neurons, they are the cells in the brain that communicate with, with each other and, um, and lead to uh, our brain to be flexible, to be able to learn, to be able to respond to stimuli from the outside. Um, and what is very important, the crucial, the crucial point here in the image is where the two actually physically interact. And this is shown here, it's called the synapse, and we're gonna study the pre-synapse and the post-synapse, so where the signal is coming in and where it's going, going to the next cell, we're gonna study the biochemical composition of that synapse. And we're gonna take cells, brain cells from the mice and cultivate them in the dish to define whether they're able to grow as well as cells derived from, their, from the healthy litter mates do they lead to, do they grow into, do they grow protrusions, extensions, projections of the same length? Do they grow into, do they more um, branch similarly, or are there any differences that we can, that we can detect between the mutants and the non-mutants? We'll also cross the mice to um, mice that have a, a fluorescent reporter in them, and that means that we can actually really in the mouse, in slices from the mouse, we can see the cells. For example, here you see cortical cells. That means in, in the outer layers of, your, of the human brain, we can see how those cells are oriented and where they project, where they, where they project, where they connect to, to other structures. And so we're gonna do that for no, the knock-in mice as well to potentially see if there are defects or, or differences again, between the, the mutant mice and the non-mutant mice. And to do all this, I have um, a lot of collaborations active, um, one being the mass spectrometry person that I have already worked with uh, in Rome, Dr. Urbani, one being, of course, Dr. Ranga Sami from TGen, who has given us cells, and we will continue to work with him or the group. Then Isabel Dominguez from Boston University, who will help me understand because she's a specialist in, in early development, so in prenatal brain development. She's gonna look at uh, our mice and see if she can see anything before the mice, mice are actually born. And um, those two persons from Germany are both uh, biochemists who are um, interested in, in, in the structure of CK2 and um, they're gonna look at um, OCNDS causing mutations to see if they cause structural changes. And finally, in order to, to really understand the functionality of the cells from the mouse, um, you know, from the OCNDS mice, I initiated the collaboration with an electrophysiologist. That's somebody who really 
takes the cells or, or slices from, from the mice to look at the functionality. Like when they talk to each other, when, they give, when brain cells give one signal from one cell to the next, how does that cell then respond? Does it respond in a similar manner or to a, less, to a lesser extent or to a stronger extent? What's that response, that functional response like? And for that, uh, uh, we're working with Dr. Venance uh, here in Paris. Um, here's a list of people who I have, uh, uh, have worked with uh, in the last years and um, particularly um, on OCNDS. Um, yeah, so now I take your questions and thank you super much for listening. Great, um, so we did get some questions during the presentation, so I'll dive in. Um, for the first question, what do you mean by knockout mice? So a knockout mice are mice where we have altered the gene of basically they're, they're different type of knockout mice, but overall it means that we are able to generate mice that do not have the CK2 expressed. Can, can you hear me? It's all good? Yeah, okay. So they do not have CK2 expressed. That can be that they have no CK2 at all in any cell. So when we make the, when we made, actually, um, Dr. Dominguez was involved in, in the first CK2 alpha knockout. When these mice were made, they were not viable because they basically didn't express, they didn't have any protein CK2 anymore. So the gene was basically cut out on both chromosomes so that the, the animal didn't make any CK2 anymore. And that, of course, wasn't good for the animal that resulted in it and these animals died. However, when one copy, when one chromosome still had the CK2 gene and led to the production of CK2, then the mice were viable. There is then another way to make um, knockout mice that is a little bit more complicated, but in the end, it always means knocking out. A gene means that you either take the gene completely out or you do something to it that it cannot lead to the protein being made. So basically a knockout mouse is a mouse that lacks the protein that you're interested in. A CK2 knockout mouse would mean there is no CK2 in those mice. And it can be a full knockout mouse, so no CK2 at all is being made, or it can be a heterozygous knockout mice, we call it, where, made, where half of the CK2 is still being made. And it's a great tool, of course, to study how important um, CK2 or any other protein of interest is and um, what the functionality of that, what, what the, the functional result is when you, lack, when you lack the protein of interest, in that case, CK2. Thank you. And the next question, is OCNDS a case of too much or too little CK2? Yeah, that's um, a good question. Of, and, and that's um, still something we're not quite clear, but I think we have data. Well, for, for, we have on the, on the total level, as far as I can tell, we don't have changes of the protein, of how much protein OCNDS patient cells, for example, have. That means I think on the, on the total, the total amount of CK2 is not really altered in OCNDS cells. But what, what, it, what, what could be is, and what we hypothesize and what is most probably true based our, on our, our data that we got so far is that the protein that is made from the gene that has the mutation, from that one copy that has this point mutation that we study, that protein will be there, but it will not be able to do the job of phosphorylation. It will not be able to do its job as well as when it, if it didn't have the mutation. So while we have still a lot of protein, we don't have the same activity, the same functional, you know, function that CK2 can perform because we have one part of the whole um, total of CK2 that cannot be as active as if it were not mutated. Thank you. Um, the next question, does CK2 affect how the brain developed in utero and after birth structurally? Um, yes, again, that we know from the knockout mice that were made in 2008, we know that when 
So again, we come to the term knockout. It's good that I got the chance to explain it better. When you have a full knockout, that means when you're, the cells of the embryo cannot make any CK2 protein, then those mice are not going to be viable until birth. They die before and they have a brain that's smaller, that has hemorrhaging, that's or a, a, a form, the, the neural tube that's not correctly formed. So that tells us that in theory, yes, CK2 has a very, very important impact on the, on the brain development, on the structures, etc. So in the case of OCNDS, it's a very different situation, right? Because we have CK2, we have probably the same amount of CK2, we just have one part of uh, CK2 that doesn't do the job as well as it should. So that's why we're expecting not any gross, um, obvious changes in the structure of the brain. I mean, the kids are doing quite well, right? In, in, in that sense, they're, they're, they're delayed in their development, but they're viable and they can live to adulthood. They can do a lot of things. So it, it means that, yes, CK2 does something, as we've learned from the knockout mice, but how exactly the fine changes that are caused by this, just this one mutation that reduces the activity of CK2, we don't quite know. It's definitely not something that hops to your eye that's very obvious. It's something much more subtle. And this is why uh, we have to study it carefully and um, do some sophisticated studies. For example, crossing the mice that we have with um, mice that have a fluorescent gene where we can see actually the neurons and how they how they're localized, how they're projecting, et cetera. So this is work that needs to be done to understand that. And hopefully in a year, we can give you some better response to that. Thank you. Um, the next question, given that this is a de novo genetic change, how useful is blood donation from relatives such as parents, grandparents, and siblings? Um, I think that that's not a, a useful, um, way of therapy because what we're looking at is a, a genetic defect and um, so it's basically a defect or um, you know a mutation in every cell and whatever blood you give will maybe give you some CK2 in those blood cells but we need um, you know CK2 to be you know functionally changed in the brain in neurons where the where the blood cells really don't get to it, it, it would would make sense maybe to get the blood um, working maybe a little bit better, but, but that's not the problem that OCNDS patients have. So I think overall, um, that's not the way to go. Okay, and then I think this question might be a good one for Dr. Chung to cover. Regarding current research on the connection between CK2 and COVID-19, is there any reason to think that our children are more at risk for infection? That's a great question. We really don't know the answer is the bottom line. Um, as I was saying in my talk, there is evidence from a couple people who I've heard about anecdotally in terms of some concern about more severe infections. Um, I will say that there are two different types of complications I worry with SARS-CoV-2, and I'm going to distinguish between those two. Um, in general, children are resilient, so that's one general sort of thing that we see overall. I haven't heard of anyone with OCN uh, with CSNK2A1 changes that have had severe complications with this. Um, and in general, with children with neurogenetic disorders, I've not been seeing severe complications with SARS-CoV-2. Um, with the acute infection, children tend to do relatively well. Um, the one thing you may have seen is there's a, a multi-systemic post-inflammatory syndrome um, that someone like Kawasaki's. Uh, for that, we do have extremely effective in treatment, which includes steroids and IVIG. And that's been working pretty universally across all patients as long as they get diagnosed and treated in the hospital soon enough. So in general, I don't think we have all the answers, but there's nothing that I'm seeing that causes me reason for significant concern. Thank you, Dr. Trung. And then um, this will be our last question, and then we'll have to move on to the next presentation. Um, uh, and this is a technical question. Do you see evidence that missense mutations can cause dominant negative effects, which could lead to a greater than 50% reduction in CK2 activity in heterozygotes? Do missense mutations behave differently from each other or from deletions? Um, I can't answer that question. I don't, I don't know the answer to it. I don't think so. I don't have evidence 
for that. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Repultz. Um, and our next pre presenter is Dr. Rangasamy. He received his PhD in biochemistry from the University of Madras, India, and subsequent postdoctoral training at the University of New Mexico and Barrow Neurological Institute before moving to TGen as a research assistant professor in neurogenomics division. The primary focus of his research is to investigate the cellular and molecular mechanisms underlying neurogenetics disorders. The use of next generation sequencing technology in the clinical setting has resulted in advancing the genetic diagnosis of numerous neurodevelopmental disorders. As a result, neurogenetics has moved from being a discipline of clinical description and classification to a molecular science discipline based on neurobiology. Once the gene is identified, scientists can ask comprehensive questions about the molecular alterations in the affected person to understand the disease pathogenesis. Dr. Rangasamy utilizes the mouse, zebrafish, and human iPSC-derived neuronal models to understand the molecular and cellular basis of neurogenetic diseases. His research is also focused on identifying disease-specific cellular phenotype for the development of high-throughput thru screening assay to develop novel therapies. And here is his presentation. Good morning, all. I'm Sampat Rangaswamy, scientist from C4RCD in Tijan, Phoenix, Arizona. Today, I'm going to, to present my research on Okar Chang neurodevelopmental disorder that we are working for the last 10 months. So before talking about my research, I want to give a small introduction about our research institute. TGEN Center for Rat Childhood Disorders, or C4RCD, is giving hope to children and their families with rat disorder through genetic diagnosis. We find the genetic cause of rat disease through genome sequencing and figure out the precise treatment for the children with rat disorders. C4RCD was started in the year 2012 so far, we have provided genetic diagnosis for more than 600 families with rat disease. A precise genetic or molecular diagnosis is vital for the entire family, but genetic diagnosis of a disease is just the beginning of a long journey. We need to do more after the genetic diagnosis of the rat disease. What we can do after genetic diagnosis of a rat disease? We need to find precise cure or treatment for the genetic disorders to help the children live a normal life. So the major goal of my research is to use the genetic information to understand the disease mechanisms which will help in the development of novel treatment. In our lab, we started CSNK2A1 research a couple years back when we diagnosed two of our families with CSNK2A1 mutation. Our active research in CSNK2A1 mutation was stimulated through our connection with Ms. Jennifer Jill and her family, along with the support from the CSNK2 foundation, CSNK2A1 foundation. So before going, sorry. So now let me explain my research. Uh, sorry, there's a break. Let me explain my research starting from patient studies with CSNK2 mutation. We are currently interested to know how the clinical phenotype varies between the patients with CSNK2 mutation. So to understand the biological mechanism, it's important to study the phenotypic variability and how the gene causes different types of phenotype. It's very important for the uh, research questions. So in 2000, 18 at our center, we have found CSNK2 mutation from four patients in two families. 
Interestingly, for the first time, we identified the common recurrent K198R mutation in three patients from the same family, which is the family A that you can see here that I have described in this slide. We found that the patient mom is the carrier of this mutation and she was also affected with this disease. All the three, the mom, affected mom, two other child, they all had developmental delay, intellectual disability. They all, they all started walking at different age and they all needed special education. However, mom had graduated from high school through special education. Both the child have varying degree of hypotonia. However, the mom and the second child relatively had a minor phenotype compared to the elder daughter. It is interesting here to note that how a single same CSNK mutation have different phenotype. This is called as phenotypic variability or the different symptoms that is called as uh, the different symptoms we call them as phenotypic variability uh, from the familial CSNK to A1 mutation. So familial CSNK to mutation within the family seems to be observed more now. And I found that through interaction with Ms. Jennifer, that there are additionally five more families with CSNK mutation in the family is, uh, is present. Then the next, like the second family, we have, we have also identified a novel CSNK2A1 variant in the active site of the protein. The patient have relatively severe, severe phenotype with developmental delay, cortical visible impairment, hypotonia. One of the most important observation in this patient was the presence of autism spectrum disorder. Uh, it's now known that many patients with CSNK2A1 mutation has been described to have autism spectrum disorders. The other, the next family or the next child from the third family we are studying was previously identified with the CSNK mutation that is PR47Q. This child also have features of ASD, but she is more social. Despite a greater number of patients were diagnosed with CSNK2 mutation, the clinical phenotype is understudied and we do not have a clear picture about the different types of uh, symptoms of the clinical phenotype yet. So when we, in general, the phenotype in patients with CSNK mutation are not yet clearly de defined. Despite the greater number of patients are diagnosed with CSNK mutation, the clinical phenotype is yet understudied and we do not have a clear picture. Phenotype spectrum of CSNK2 mutation is not completely understood. Why, there are, why or how the CSNK mutation cause different phenotype, still we are not clear about it. Also, there is no clinical diagnostic criteria for patients with CSNK2A1 mutation. Variability of phenotype between patients with same mutation is frequently observed. However, the most common phenotype with the CSNK2A1 mutation are developmental delay, GI problems, dysmorphic features, mostly recognizable facial features, and you see most often behavioral problems. Uh, I'm talking about phenotype uh, for you all, just in the, uh, how I can describe phenotype. Phenotype is the observable clinical characteristics of an individual. So here the individuals are the CSNK2A1 patients. To understand the CSNK2 phenotype pattern in Okechang neurodevelopmental disorder, we collected and analyzed the phenotypic data from the published literature. Now we found around 31 patients uh, have been described in the research literature so far with the CSNK2A1 mutation. The data indicates here that there is no sex difference. Equally male and female are affected. And importantly, hypotonia, one of the symptoms you see with the patients are not uniform means it's not present in all the patients. 50 per, around 50% 50 
patients were found to have hypotonia. However, developmental delay or disability is present in almost all the patients with the CSNK2A1 mutation. Microcephaly is an important phenotype in patients with a neuro neurodevelopmental disorder. Uh, around 29% of patients described to have microcephaly where the head size or the circumference is smaller than the normal in the CSNK2A1 mutation. However, in majority of the patients, it is not clearly diagnosed. It is also interesting, interesting to note that structural difference of brain was observed in 37% of patients with CSNK2A1 mutation, while similar percentage of patients have not have any observable structural abnormalities. Further, we observed that or found that intellectual disability is present in majority of the patients described with CSNK2A1 mutation. But the degree of severity of the intellectual disability is not uniform in the patients, in the patient population. Uh, small, percentage, small percentage of patients have been described to have either milder or absence of intellectual disability. We are still continuing our analysis on the clinical symptoms of patients with the CSNK2A1 mutation, and it's very important to precisely define the clinical symptoms in CSNK2A1 patients uh, to have a right recommendation for interventions. So what is the importance of clinical symptoms or clinical phenotype in research? Despite the patients having different clinical symptoms with the CSNK2A1, it is important for the patient's family and health healthcare providers uh, to better understand or better assess the uh, clinical symptoms or clinical phenotype by a pediatric neurologist or developmental behavioral pediatrician to fully understand the neurological and developmental phenotype. This clear understanding of phenotype will guide better treatment options or the interventions for the child. So from now, I'm going to describe about the CSNK2 mutation that's described in the literature. Uh, from the published scientific literature, we explored the different types of mutation in the CSNK2A1 gene. You can see that the mutations are spread all over the protein. However, there are some mutations in the gene that are present in multiple patients with Okachang neurodevelopmental disorder. One particular mutation, the K198R or the lysine 198RG9 mutation is seen in nine patients. And this is the most common mutation in people with this disorder. We are currently analyzing the position of mutation, how it correlates with the phenotype. Next, I'm going to present our research with the CSNK2A1 mutation uh, in cell and animal model to understand how CSNK2A1 mutation caused this disease. First, let me describe our research with cell model of CSNK2A1 mutation. We have established fibroblast cell lines from four patients from the skin who have three different types of mutation. Uh, we recently performed RNA sequencing analysis of the patient-derived fibroblast cells with the CSNK2A1 mutation uh, and compare it with the control. Control means those cells that doesn't have the CSNK2A1 mutation. So RNA sequencing, I'm talking here, it means it is an experiment to count the copies of the genes expressed in the cells. It is, important, it is an important experiment to identify the cellular biomarker which is critical for understanding the biology and identifying new drug target for this disease. So in this slide, you can see the results that we got from the RNA sequencing analysis of fibroblast. This is a preliminary data which we are currently exploring further. Fibroblast cells expresses high amount of casein kinase 2 genes. Casein kinase 2 genes mean all the genes that are needed for making the casein kinase 2 enzyme or the CK2 enzyme. 
CK2 enzyme contains three subunits CSNK2A1, A2, and CSNK2B. So, CS, mutation in the CSNK2A1 gene causes this uh, Okachan neurodevelopmental disorder. However, all these three genes contribute to the protein structure or the, the protein that actively involves in enzymatic action inside the cell. In the patients, the expression of CSNK2A1 subunit is relatively less compared to the cells from people who do not have the mutation. While the other subunits, CSNK2A2 and B subunits are expressed at higher level. We also found some genes that are significantly altered in the expression from the patient cells. Currently, we are working to understand the importance of this information, which will help in identifying the disease mechanism. Let me now take you to the world of zebrafish. We are also working with zebrafish model to understand how CSNK2A1 mutation affects the brain development. Zebrafish model is widely used to study human genetic disorders. Research with the zebrafish model has revealed biological process and disease mechanism behind many neurodevelopmental disorders such as muscular dystrophy and epileptic encephalopathy in children. Recently, this model has helped to identify new drugs to treat genetic epilepsy in children. Zebrafish is a unique organism because it developed fully matured brain in 72 hours and is also transparent to visualize the organs that is developed inside the zebrafish. And also 70% of the genes in the zebrafish have similarity to the human gene and approximately 84% of the gene that causes human disorders are also present in the zebrafish. This model is also cost effective and we can generate hundreds of fish in a week to do more research. So how we can use CS zebrafish model to study CSNK2 mutation? So this, this, we synthesize and purify human CSNK2A1 mutant gene mRNA and inject this mutant gene into this zebrafish embryo at single cell stage. The zebrafish, since the zebrafish can develop brain in 72 hours, we were able to characterize how the mutant CSNK2A1 gene that we inject in the single cell stage of zebrafish can affect the brain development. Uh, currently with the zebrafish modeling, we are micro injecting the mutant mRNAs and, uh, and study how the fish behave and how the brain development happen. Our overall hope is to characterize the neurological phenotype of mutant CSNK2A1 mRNA. Uh, defining the fish phenotype and brain abnormalities with different mutation will aid in the development of best mouse model to test preclinical pre therapies. Uh, we also plan to demonstrate the molecular mechanism of actions of this mutation. So that means how this mutation really affect the cell development in the Okerchen neurodevelopmental disorder. Is it through the dominant negative or is it through the haploid insufficiency mechanism? This is what we are looking to find. We are currently working with three genetic, three different genetic mutation in the, uh, with the zebrafish model. Um, and we hope to find some interesting results soon. Here I want to show a small, small video uh, that, that we, we are currently working on. So reason, some, last year we have created a zebrafish model for epilepsy. Uh, we created this model of zebrafish that recapitulate clinical phenotype of patients with DNM1 gene mutation. So this model exactly recapitulate the Caesar phenotype seen in patients with the DNA mutation. You can see the video here. The fish will have Caesars because of the we injected the micro we injected the mRNA containing DNA one mutation.
Another important work that we are, we are performing at our center is to create neuronal cells from patient deroid induced pluripotent stem cells. The main goal for us is to create the iPSC derived cells with the different mutation uh, from the fibroblast cells that we have. Such cells will help us to understand what biological pathway are affected in the neuronal cell. Currently, Simon's research light is also making iPSC from blood cells and we will harmonize our effort to create stem cell from the fibroblast cells that we have. So at, at, at our center, we are also geared towards developing gene therapy approaches that we can test in cell and animal models of different genetic uh, disorders. So CSNK2 uh, mutation uh, or the Okachan neurodevelopmental disorder is one of our interest in the future for gene therapy. So overall, uh, you can see that many scientists are working to understand how the CSNK2 even mutation causes Okachin neurodevelopmental syndrome uh, using different cell and model system. We expect our studies and other scientists working in the field will help in understanding the biology and identifying new treatment for Okachin neurodevelopmental syndrome. Our overarching goal is to develop gene therapy which we are currently working in collaboration with City of Hope. And this is an exciting area of work that we are very, very, very excited. So finally, I want to thank our team members from C4RCD and the lab who are doing an amazing work with cell and, cell and zebra of this model. I also, I also want to thank the funding support from CSNK to A1 Foundation and other organizations such as NIHDOD, and finally to Jennifer, who is doing such a wonderful work supporting the scientists in this research. Thank you. I'm looking forward to take your questions. Thank you. Great, and now just as a reminder to everyone, you can submit any questions that you have for Dr. Rangasamy using the um, Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. All right, it looks like we may not be getting any questions. Um, so I just want to give it one more second. In case any come in. Here is one. Um, how does the CSNK2A1 mutation look in comparison to other mutation regarding its potential for gene therapy? Thanks for the question. Uh, uh, still, I think we have to go a long way uh, uh, to really figure it out um, uh, how each, uh, each gene is going to be different in terms of gene therapy. Uh, the first, I mean, we all, uh, one of the main, uh, main issue is that uh, how specific uh, of the gene therapy uh, will be and how much uh, also can it reach to the all, for example, in the neurodevelopmental disorder. Uh, whatever we develop, whatever therapy we develop, it should reach all the cells in the brain. So, is that a feasible uh, approach? Uh, so, that's uh, that's that's really required the bio uh, availability. Uh, how how this uh, gene uh, gene therapy can reach almost all the cells? Uh, so, it, it I do believe that the CSNK two A one gene will not be different from other genes. It's are it's going to uh, have the same problem of uh, tar targeting, uh, I mean, highly specific target mechanism that we have to develop. Uh, I think, uh, uh, but any, 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 any gene therapy, uh, especially with this, uh, uh, with, that can correct the, uh, only the mutant. Uh, here, the C CSNK2A1 really is expressed in almost all the cells. And uh, we have to, first of all, figure out which cells are important for uh, gene therapy. Is it only the brain we are going to target or is it going to be other organs as well? So that's where uh, the CSNK is going to be different. Uh, for other genes such as X-linked uh, uh, genes like Red syndrome causing MECP2, we need to only focus uh, how to 
design a therapy that really uh, that goes to the brain and correct the mutation. But here CSNK it looks like it's an essential gene in almost uh, for most uh, cells. So we have to figure out how we can make a gene therapy that can be reached to all cells. Thank you. Um, and this next question is asking, would you share your data on RNA-seq with other researchers? Absolutely, yeah, we're going to share it. As this, in case, in, the, in data sharing, so we, we do uh, perform the analysis and we'll publish it. When we publish, we have to submit the data in the repository. Uh, NH, NIH have its own repository, but uh, many journals also ask for the uh, data submission. So we will follow the guidelines. And I think uh, we are already, I'm planning, we are going to work with the, uh, Dr. Uh, Haik, who just presented, as he had some uh, data, we will collaborate with her to uh, available for all. Thank you. And this next question is asking um, if there's any need for iPSCs made from relatives without the mutation. That's an interesting question. Thank you. Uh, so I think uh, Simon's, I think they're also doing different uh, approaches to create a better iPSC model. So one of the scientific term people use isogenic uh, model. That means you, for, for example, we need only one cell, that's patient cell that have the mutation. What we want to do is this, uh, we also want to take the patient cell and correct the mutation using CRISPR-Cas uh, uh, genetic uh, uh, modification to have the control. So that means from the same, from the same patient cell, you will have the, uh, uh, both the mutant and the control cell line because uh, there is always a significant uh, influence of genetic background. Even then uh, we can have different patients like families, uh, different cells from family members that will uh, still uh, will not help us to uh, take the effect of genetic background. So the best way of uh, doing iPSC modeling is to create isogenic, means take the patient cells, create, convert it to iPSC cell, then the same iPSC cells cre uh, create a uh, control, create a normal cell. That means you correct the patient mutation using the uh, CRISPR-Cas gene, th gene th therapy technique to have the normal cell. So you compare this, these two cells to really understand what exactly is this biological mechanism that is going to really uh, help in better understanding. But I think parent cells is more enough right now uh, to do the, all the record studies. Um, and in addition to the isogenic cell line we talk. Thank you. And that was the last question that we had. So we're going to move on to our final presentation. Um, but before we play that presentation, I just wanted to let everyone know that at the end of that presentation, um, while the webinar will be over, we are going to open um, the webinar up to any family members who'd like to connect. So we'll allow you to be able to turn your video on and unmute yourself and talk. So um, if you do want to be part of that, make sure you stay on until the end. Um, and with that, we will go ahead and play our final presentation by Jennifer Sills on uh, the CSNK 2A1 Foundation. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Simon Searchlight, for having this virtual family conference. We wish we were all together in person, and hopefully we will be next year. I wanted to um, tell you a little bit first, um, for those that don't know me, my name is Jennifer Sills. And my daughter, Juliet, who's 11, has Okerchung Neurodevelopmental Syndrome. And in 2006, uh, we received the diagnosis that she, um, um, that revealed that she had Okerchung Neurodevelopmental Syndrome. And at the time, our neurologist told us that she was the sixth in the world to be diagnosed with Okerchung. And she sent us home with a paper um, that was written by Dr. Chung and Dr. Oker describing the, this brand new syndrome. This was the only piece of information available out there uh, that would talk about the syndrome. And as I sat down to read it, I saw that there were words in a line with a period at the end. So it was written in English and there were sentences, but I did not understand a word it was saying. I had to look up every other word. And at that time I knew we had to do better. 
for my jewels and for all of our kids. We needed to have information that we could understand that would empower us to be better advocates for our kids. And the more information we have, the more our children can live worthwhile, vital, and vibrant lives. And in 2016, I called Dr. Chung and I had two pages worth of questions and we got through four questions um, when she told me the kind of cold hard facts about rare disease research. And she told me at that time that patient families shouldered the burden of accelerating rare disease research. And if we wanted to learn more about our syndrome, we needed to build an army. And that we did. In 2018, we launched CSN K2A1 Foundation, and Dr. Chung and Dr. Oker helped us come up with our kind of three-year objectives. And I'm happy to report today that we have met all of these objectives. And even though we've made amazing progress in a short period of time, we still have a long ways to go. And working with you and researchers and our board, we will do this but we can't do it without your help. And we, when we started the foundation, we wanted to make, our patient, make sure our patient families were armed with information. And this first starts with our website. And probably most of you have never done a deep dive into our website because we were triaging our lives and just trying to get through the day. And so today we were gonna go through patient resources together with giving you a small update on our research and then also ways that you can make an impact today. So as we look at our website, we have um, a one-page document, we call it, which gives you kind of the facts and most common questions about Okra Chung Neurodevelopmental Syndrome, together with recommendations and measures that providers and doctors and school districts can take when they have someone in their care that have Okra Chung Neurodevelopmental Syndrome. And I encourage you to print this out and give it to everyone that you know, because the more people that know about it and get familiar with it, the better help we can get for our kids. On our website, we also have a blog. And here, this sometimes is the first time patients are um, meeting other families that have Okra Chung. So they read stories about um, individuals' journeys and families' journeys to diagnosis, together with success that they've had with different therapies. Also on our blog, we give an update about events we've had um, or exciting news. And so I think this is one of the ways that you can get involved very easily is if you want to tell about, or if you want to share your journey to diagnosis, you can do that here and we can share it with our community. We also have videos on our website. We've made awareness videos for Rare Disease Day or Giving Tuesday or International Day. There are informational videos, research updates, conference videos. So this video will be up there together with all the other videos that we've had in these general sessions. They are, these are a great resource. They're short. You can share them with family and friends. We also have our contact registry. This is our lifeline. Right now, the foundation is in charge of keeping track of all the patients in the world that have OCNDS. And so here, when patients register with the foundation, we're able to get in contact with them and keep them up to date on the most current information about OCNDS announcements, um, uh, events. So this contact registry is incredibly important. We also have published research on our website. There are 11 papers to date. We have the abstracts available, but we're more than happy to make sure that you're armed with information and we will get these to you for free because you do have to pay for most publications. Um, so just so you know that this is a resource for you if you would like it. Um, we also have a link to Simon Searchlight, who's conducting our long-term natural history study. And this is incredibly important. I think as you've seen from the presentation this morning, our um, research is only as robust as your participation. And so this is where we learn about what the trajectory of the syndrome looks like, what we should look out for. Um, and so this we highly encourage, if you haven't already, for everyone to sign up for the Simon Searchlight um, natural history study. On our website, we also have faces of OCNDS where we feature pictures of those individuals with um, Okra Chung Neurodevelopmental Syndrome. And this is important for three reasons. One, 
when individuals are first diagnosed and they come to our site, most of them have never met another child like theirs. And so for them to see faces, almost like looking in a mirror at their child of all these beautiful children with OCNDS, you can see how they actually look alike. So I think this is incredibly powerful for newly diagnosed families. Two, this is incredibly powerful for our researchers. Normally they're in a lab, they are looking at cells. They have no idea that this cell re represents Juliet or Claire or Thomas. And so this puts a face to the cell that they're looking at. This is who they are fighting for. And we want them to know who they're fighting for because I think it makes them feel better about their work, but also wants them to make, make them work harder and also become champions for OCNDS patients. And third, this is important for our donors. When our donors, when we're asking them for money, we want them to know that their dollars are helping make these kids' lives better. On our website, we also have OCNDS cases in which we keep up to date. So you can see that this is not just limited to the US or one area. This is a worldwide issue. We are a worldwide community. Um, and our foundation is reaches worldwide. We're really excited um, about this new endeavor. It's our inaugural parent um, advisory board. And uh, we just selected our participants. There are 12 of them and soon we will be announcing and introducing each one of you to them. Our patient advisory board is here to advise our board of directors brainstorm ideas, share insights from the parent perspective, and they will also work on projects that are important to the community. And you should be on the lookout. They're going to um, finalize their first project shortly, which will be uh, a needs assessment survey. And partnership within our community and us getting together and building our own army is what's gonna accelerate rare disease research and make us stronger. And so we're so excited to have this parent advisory board who's just gonna help push our organization and our agenda, and which is um, making our kids' lives better, um, uh, even faster. We um, are located on social media. We're on Facebook. Um, we have a public foundation page. If you haven't liked it, please do share it with your friends. Here we give. Um, updates on the foundation together with share articles that are important to our community. Um, we also have a closed group on Facebook for caretakers and parents together with a friends and family and providers group that they're able to join. We're also on Instagram in which we show pictures um, featuring families wearing their t-shirts like I am today, um, traveling around the world, um, to show that um, the sun never sets on our organization. We are 24 seven trying to seek answers for our children and our families. Uh, we are also on Twitter and LinkedIn. If you happen to be in the industry or in the medical profession or in research, it might be good for you to join us on there. Those are kind of more of those platforms. Campaigns. So um, we have two major fundraisers a year. One is an annual golf tournament in Los Angeles. Um, this year, we um, had to cancel our event. However, we had amazingly gracious donors who did not ask for their donations back. So we still had a pretty good year, not our best year, um, but we're really, really grateful because we have some research projects that I'll be telling you about that we're funding this year. And we also participate as our, one of our major yearly fundraiser in Giving Tuesday which is a worldwide online event taking place on the Tuesday after Thanksgiving in the US. Um, and uh, uh, these two have been uh, really successful events for us. We have two awareness campaigns. One, uh, this year we first launched our official OCNDS Awareness Day, which is April 5th. And the reason why we chose April 5th is because April is the month in which the first paper was released identifying Ochre Chung Neurodevelopmental Syndrome. And the fifth was is for the five patients that were initially identified in the paper that were soon joined by a large community. 
And uh, let's see, sorry. Uh, our second major awareness day is Rare Disease Day. And this is the last day in February. Um, we have a new awareness campaign coming out, which is a small awareness campaign, which we'll post through social media. And it's called Milestone Monday. And I think as we all know, our kids work thousands of times harder than the average child just to reach the smallest of milestones. And we think that it's important for us to celebrate those. And so not only are we gonna be able to celebrate these with our community, but others out there that don't know anything about OCNDS. And so we will educate them along the way as they are also celebrating these small, small milestones. Smaller fundraisers, fundraisers that we have, um, Amazon Smile in the US, um, you can select um, CSNK 2A1 Foundation as your charity of choice. Um, also on PayPal Giving Fund, you can do that too. If you're hosting an event in the US, we are registered with pledging. You can choose us as your charity of choice when you're hosting an event after COVID is over. Um, birthday Facebook fundraisers have been some of the most successful smaller fundraisers because these are worldwide, which is amazing. So if you're in France or in Canada um, or in Australia, you can start a um, fundraiser on Facebook in which we receive 100% of the proceeds. We also have an item shop on our website. It's um, where we sell um, merchandise. And this year, two of our parents um, Amber Reynolds and Melody Kratis um, designed some new merchandise. And so some of the proceeds from the merchandise goes to the foundation. And also a few times a year, we um, do an online um, shopping event at Boone Supply in which 40% of the proceeds go to our foundation. We've built in the last three years, almost three years, some partnerships and also patient resources. Uh, one is with TGen. Um, TGen, um, we uh, partnered with them to begin a research program at TGen under the Node Narayan, Dr. Node Narayan. And their research aims to answer the questions, is this reversible? Are there any FDA approved small molecules that alleviate or treat OCNDS symptoms? Um, so we're really excited about this long-term partnership. We've also partnered with Nord and Global Genes and the benefit to our community is that we have access to hundreds of other rare disease organizations. So if there's a question that we can't answer that you need help with, we have a resource that we can go to. So for example, we had a patient family in Austria who was having difficulty getting services. And so we went to these patient groups and asked, do you have any connections in Austria um, and, and anyone that could help our family navigate this system there? And lo and behold, they had a wonderful contact that's been incredibly resourceful for them. Um, so um, this is, we love and we're excited that we have these partnerships. We just partnered with um, Indo-US Rare, which is um, bridging the US and India. And we suspect that we have a large um, OCNDS population in India. Although to date, we've only found one patient. We're certain that there are more. So we're excited about this partnership. And many of our families, suffer from epilepsy. And so um, we um, have as a patient resource, the Epilepsy Foundation. We don't run the foundation in a vacuum or in a silo. Thank goodness we have a scientific advisory board right now filled with three powerhouses, Dr. Wendy Chung, Dr. O Vulcan Oker, and Kyle Redderer, um, who's from GeneVX. And as we're trying to figure out the trajectory of our foundation and trying to decide what new research projects we're going to fund, they are incredibly influential in guiding us. So we're grateful to have them on our team. I wanted to give you a little bit of an update on kind of the, the CSNK 2A1 foundation funded projects. We believe in open science and um, collaborative research projects. And so we're happy to report that all of our researchers are working together. We have frequent calls in which they talk to each other and they make sure that their research is complementary to each other and not, um, and not contradictory to each other. So, um, or they're not overlapping in a way that's not meaningful. 
so as I mentioned, we have the research program going on with TGen, which we're super excited about. Um, Dr. Heike Riefholtz, who um, is really kind of the team leader um, who is doing our multi-year biochemistry study of OCNDS. She and I have traveled um, in the US and over Europe meeting patient families. And um, it's been an incredible to have her at the helm. We have some upcoming research projects, which we're really excited with three researchers who wrote the book on CK2, which is the protein that's created by our syndrome. And their research hopes to answer the question how the modified CK2 alpha proteins found in OCNDS patients work. They're going to look at it in 3D. They're gonna look how stable they are, how they react with other proteins that CK2 alpha typically binds to, and how they control the development of the brain. And they're going to look at this in frog embryos. So we have those projects to begin soon. I who through the general sessions have heard about reagents, and I wanted to let you know about the reagents that we have made um, in connection with Simons, that Dr. Heike Riebholz has made, and um, that TGen as well has made. Um, we have LCLs, IPSC cells that have been derived from our patient population. And so Simons has made eight or nine of those, which are available to qualified researchers. We currently have one mouse model and we're about to make a second mouse model. And we also have patient derived fibroblasts, which are skin cells at TGen. And coming soon, we are gonna have zebrafish, frogs, and more mouse models that mimic the mutations that are in our patient population. And it's one of the reasons why it's important to register with Simons and for us to know um, more about the mutations that our patient population has to register them because you want for your child's mutation to be represented in research. Um, the other amazing thing that I just wanna mention about the reagents is that we aim to find a treatment or a cure for OCNDS. And we hope we get there first. We hope we have the breakthrough. Um, that is what we're working towards. But if we don't, and another rare organization does, and they have a model which we could follow, we have all of the reagents and basic research in place to capitalize on that right away. We are not five years behind. We are right where we need to be if there's a breakthrough that we can take advantage of and we could use for our own disease. And so I think that's why it's excited that we have this arsenal of reagents that are available for us to use for research. We um, have upcoming parent education. Um, sorry, that are, it's incredibly important for our patient community to be informed. Um, we think that you are on the front lines and you need all the information you can have to be an effective advocate. And so that being said, we've come up with um, kind of some patient education um, to hope better inform you. And um, first is patient education webinars. Uh, in September, we're gonna begin our first webinar in which we are going to feature Music Therapy 101. And we're going to have a music therapist come in and talk about how she's used this with an OCNDS patient. And then afterwards, we're gonna have an OCNDS family talk about their experience with it. But through the webinars, we hope that we're going to feature different types of therapies that families are using that are helping their communities. So when you're thinking about um, possible therapies that will help your child, that you'll be more armed with information. Because when you first receive this diagnosis, if you've never had a child or experience with um, rare disease or a delay, you're gonna hear speech therapy, occupational therapy, ABA, and you're gonna have no idea what any of those things mean. Um, and so we wanna make sure that you're armed with the most current information um, and you can um, put forth the best plan possible for your child to be able to um, live their best and happiest lives. We are having um, OCNDS family calls and I think one of the silver linings to COVID, if there are any, but I think this is one, is that all of us know what Zoom is now 
and one of our patient families actually in Austria had suggested doing a family Zoom call in which we would talk about the services um, and challenges um, that uh, one, the services that, that families are using and the challenges that um, families are seeing in some of the younger children. And that was an incredibly successful call. So after that, we've had um, more calls. And one of them, um, uh, Terry Jordan led, one of our um, OCNDS parents, in which we had um, teenager uh, parents of teenagers and adults with OCNDS um, that were discussing challenges and successes that they are seeing um, in those years. Um, and so we plan to roll out other um, Zoom calls, doing it by country and then also by topic. So our next one is the UK to connect all of our UK families um, and then Australia. So we're excited about that. And if you have any topics that you would like to um, uh, have discussed by the community, or if you're feeling like your region or country wants to get together via Zoom, we're happy to facilitate that. So please contact us at uh, info at csnk2a1foundation.org um, and we can help you facilitate that. We're also building a library of visuals supports. Um, we don't want every, anyone to reinvent the wheel. This is hard enough. And there are people out there that have created amazing visual supports that help our kids with transitions, with um, explaining what's happening in life. So whether that's a kind of a coming of age or a puberty story or a social story um, about moving from junior high to high school or a calendar that allows for our children to have more control and choices. And so we're building this library of supports um, to help our patient families. Um, we are also creating a documentary called Love Needs No Words. Um, in 2018, when we had our first in-person family conference, um, uh, two, individual, uh, two girls with OCNDS met for the first time. They lived 2,000 miles apart, and they developed this incredible friendship. And one of them is nonverbal, and the other one is verbal. But they talk five days a week as they're getting ready for school each morning. Um, and it's a beautiful story about how friendship knows no bounds. Um, and it's also just a, also a story about the power of community and what it means um, when you can bring a community together um, that's struggling from the same um, neurodevelopmental syndrome. We're also working with our scientific advisory board and our researchers to create videos and brief explanations about our syndrome. Again, so you're armed with information so you know when someone says CK2, what does that protein do? What does that even mean? Um, so we are working with them so this to, for this to be a resource for our patient community. Um, we're also establishing resource parents by country and region. Um, and even though we travel worldwide at the foundation to meet families, we don't know everything about every region or every country. And so we want to have experts, parent experts within those regions and countries to help guide our families. Um, so we're going to do the UK and the Netherlands, Australia, we're going to break up the US into regions. Um, and one of the reasons um, why we decided this was important is when we were in the UK visiting with the UK families, they introduced us to the disability toilet key, which was astonishing to me um, to find out that in the UK, in order to get into a handicapped bathroom, you need a key. And you have to apply with the government to get a key, or there also happens to be a key you can buy off Amazon. And as our patient families were meeting in the UK, kind of talking about this challenge, because when you have a nine-year-old that still requires changing because they are unable to toilet, um, this creates a huge issue. If you're crammed into a tiny bathroom, I mean, you have like no dignity, no space, and so, Going, being able to use the handicap bathroom is incredibly important. And at that point, sort of a light bulb went off, like we need to establish uh, resource parents for individuals in each country. And it just so happened at that meeting, what was so beautiful is that one of the parents actually had two keys and they were able to give one to a patient family that didn't have one. And so it changes their life, even small, small things that have nothing to do with research can make a meaningful change in our patients' lives. 
And this is why information is so important and us meet, getting together and meeting and sharing resources is so important because when they go out now in this one instance and um, they don't have to fret about when their child has, um, you know, um, needs to be changed, that they can change them in comfort and with dignity. And so I think the resource parents are going to be incredibly, um, incredibly helpful and um, meaningful for our community. We're building a database of OCNDS champions that will have doctors, geneticists, and specialists that know about ochre chum neurodevelopmental syndrome because I think most of us have experienced when we've gone to the doctors that they come in the room and they've said, oh, so I've read one paper online about OCNDS, um, so this is what I think. Um, and that's not enough. Um, we need to have doctors that kind of really know OCNDS through and through um, and geneticists specialists to make sure that our kids are getting the care that they need and deserve. We're working with Dr. Oker and Dr. Chung and also TGen to establish centers of excellence for OCNDS patients where you do a hospital uh, there would be multiple doctors that you could see within one day that also know OCNDS patients. And um, again, like I said, we're really excited about our patient advisory board. Um, this is going to be a huge resource and um, connection for our community. Um, and again, please be on the lookout for the needs assessment survey. And um, we are only as strong as our largest participation. So I highly encourage you to participate. You have the ability to make an impact today. You, and it can be just the smallest, smallest act that can make an impact for our community. And I've listed them out here. You can read through them. Sorry about that. We just had technical error. I apologize. Um, you can read through here. Um, you can connect with other families. You can sign up for our contact registry. If you haven't already, um, you can sign up for Simon's Searchlight. It's now in English and in Spanish and they hope to roll out other languages soon. Um, you can invest in a cure by donating or holding a fundraiser. Um, or you could give hope to others by writing your story and sharing it on our blog. There are many, many ways to get involved um, and no um, way is too small. Every single way has a massive major impact. I wanna thank you for having me today. I wanna thank you to the people that I've been able to meet in person for welcoming me, welcoming me into your arms and into your hearts. It's an incredibly humbling, humbling experience. Um, I just wanna say one other thing. The reason why um, we're pushing forward with research is that we do have firm belief and hope that we will find a treatment and a cure. You know, the time is now, I always say this, the time is now, science is catching up and we are in a position with our foundation and with our research and our parents and our researchers to make a huge difference in our kids' lives and to change their trajectory. Um, thank you so much for having me and I look forward to us being in person next year. Thank you.